In this first Fundamentals of Misting video, we're going to begin our examination of the main components of a misting system and discuss in detail how they work. We're going to start with the pump. Along the way, we're going to boil everything down to a set of seven pressure engineering rules. If you follow these rules, every one of your systems should reliably create the blanket of protection that we talked about in the intro video. Let's start by looking at a drawing of a very basic misting system. You'll notice three important components. A pump that draws fluid from a reservoir, tubing that carries the fluid, and nozzles. Together we refer to the tubing and nozzles as the nozzle circuit. Let's take a closer look at each of those, starting with the pump. Mr. Way's systems use what is called a rotary vane pump. You can see that it is about the size of your fist, and it weighs about two pounds. It has a generally cylindrical shape and is made from brass. On this end of the cylinder, we see a stem surrounded by a seal. You can turn this stem with your hand. This is where the pump is connected to the motor that drives it. The stem fits into a slot in the motor's hub, and the connection is made with a collar, like so. On the other end of the pump, you'll see a couple of ports, marked by arrows that indicate the fluid flow path. The port marked by the green arrows that points into the pump is the intake side. We've installed a push-to-connect fitting that accepts a length of what is called PEX pipe, through which fluid from the reservoir enters the pump. The port marked by the red arrow pointing out of the pump is the discharge side. In this side is a push-to-connect T-fitting with ports that will accept quarter-inch tubing. One of these ports will be connected to tubing in the nozzle circuit. The other is connected to tubing that leads to a valve which helps the nozzle circuit bleed pressure when the pump stops at the end of a miss cycle. We'll talk more about that in another video. On this end of the pump, you'll also see a fitting that contains the head of a screw. This screw is actually the top of a needle valve, and you can use a flathead screwdriver to adjust the pressure the pump is producing. We'll cover when you might want to do that later in the video. Now let's talk about how a rotary vane pump works. Look at this animated cutaway of a rotary vane pump in action. The intake is on the right side, the discharge is on the left. Inside, there is a circular rotor rotating inside a larger circular cavity. The centers of these two circles are offset. The veins slide into and out of the rotor, creating a seal on all edges, and vein chambers that transfer the fluid from the inlet to the discharge. Note that the size of the chambers change during the rotation. On the intake side, you'll see that the size of the chambers created by the veins increases as the rotor moves clockwise past the inlet. This creates a suction that pulls fluid into the pump. As the veins move toward the discharge side, the chamber decreases in size, adding pressure to the fluid as it exits the pump. There are a number of reasons we use this type of pump in our systems. It generates the flow and pressure that our systems require. It will prime itself, meaning that the pump doesn't have to be full of fluid to start, like some other kinds of pumps. It is relatively inexpensive. It is very reliable, provided the intake filter is routinely cleaned. And finally, it is easy to replace in the field if it does fail. Now let's talk about flow and pressure through the pump. First, let's discuss flow. Look at this simple schematic. A represents the flow of fluid into the pump from the fluid reservoir. B represents the flow of fluid out through the nozzles. A has to equal B after the pump has primed itself and is operating in steady state. Now let's look at C. C represents the flow of fluid through what is called an internal bypass in the pump. This type of pump always pushes the same amount of fluid, no matter how many nozzles are in the nozzle circuit. Whatever flow doesn't exit through the nozzles gets recirculated in the bypass. So if there are a lot of nozzles in the circuit and B, the flow out to the nozzles is high, then the flow through the bypass is low. If there are fewer nozzles and B is low, then the flow through the bypass is high. Our standard pump is always pumping 107 gallons per hour. Whatever doesn't go out through the nozzle circuit gets sent back through the bypass. An average residential system has about 40 nozzles, which translates to about 25 gallons per hour of flow through the nozzle circuit. That means 82 gallons per hour is being recirculated during a missed cycle. 
So you can see there's a lot of extra capacity. It turns out that 107 gallons per hour is enough capacity to theoretically supply 150 nozzles. With that much flow to the nozzles, there wouldn't be any flow through the bypass. We say theoretically because in reality you can rarely configure a nozzle circuit with more than about 70 to 80 nozzles. We'll talk about why that is in another video where we discuss pressure drop. Now let's talk about the pressure the pump generates. The harder the pump has to work to push fluid through the bypass valve, the more pressure it imparts to the fluid that gets sent down the nozzle circuit. To adjust the pressure the pump is producing, you can turn a screw to either open or close a needle valve in the bypass. When you turn the screw clockwise, you are partially closing the valve and restricting the flow through it, so the pump has to work harder, and it produces more pressure. When you turn the screw the other way, the pump produces less pressure. Our units have pressure gauges, like this one, installed on them so you can adjust the pressure to reflect the nozzle circuit you've set up. The factory setting is for the pump to generate about 250 PSI when connected to a standard 40 nozzle circuit. Remember, by 250 PSI we're talking about the pressure at the unit, not downstream in the nozzle circuit. If the size of your nozzle circuit is small, say 20 nozzles or less, you'll need to open the bypass to get the pressure at the pump to read 250 PSI. If you have, say, 60 nozzles or more, you'll need to close it to get to 250 PSI. It is very important that you understand the limits of the pump when adjusting the bypass. The pumps will fail at sustained use above 275 PSI. Which brings us to rule number one. Adjust the pump bypass to produce 250 PSI at the unit, never higher. If your pump is set at 250 PSI and you are having problems getting adequate pressure and flow out of your nozzle circuit, don't increase the pump pressure to fix the problem. The problem is not the pump. Rather, you have too much pressure drop in your nozzle circuit and you'll need to rethink how it is plumbed. We'll talk about that in another video. Repeating rule number one for emphasis. Adjust the pump bypass to produce 250 PSI at the unit, never higher.